All right. Yeah, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, welcome, everybody, to today's discussion. We're going to be talking about getting back to the basics, how to win at customer success in 2021. So we're going to have a very nice, easygoing, relaxing conversation with some of the brightest minds in customer success. Today with us, we've got Clark Dixon from Experity Health, uh, Brooklyn Baker from Everyone Social, and Luis Carranza from Meltwater. Um, you know, after a year like most of us have never experienced before, it's really important to get focused on those foundational elements, those basic things that are going to make your customers successful this year, and hopefully make it easier on your team to, uh, to support them through that success. So <clears throat> we're going to go ahead and get started, and we're going to talk today a little bit about what matters most to your customers this year and how to figure that out, techniques where you can get that information, um, building a team um, and the technology you need to scale, and then also putting data to work for you and, um, and how to get really good health scores out of that data. So <clears throat> before we jump in, a couple housekeeping items. Uh, the webinar is going to be recorded, and we'll share, um, we'll share the recording after the discussion. Um, we'll also be doing some polls during, during the discussion. So we encourage everybody to participate in those and share your input. We're going to be discussing the results of those polls throughout the course of the discussion. And then lastly, if you have any questions for our panelists, please go ahead and type them into the question box. I'm going to be monitoring that, and we'll be bringing those questions um, into the discussion as we go along. So don't be shy about that. <clears throat> All right, a couple of quick introductions, and then we'll get started. My name is Dan Bonet. I'm Chief Revenue Officer at UserIQ. Um, our mission at UserIQ is to give customer success teams the power um, to predict outcomes and impact customers company growth with the most intuitive action-oriented software platform on the market. I'm going to be facilitating the discussion today. <clears throat> Next up, oops, went too far. Next up, we've got Brooklyn Baker, who's Director of Client Success at Everyone Social. Brooklyn, if you don't mind taking a few moments to talk a little bit about your background and what you do at Everyone Social. Awesome. Happy to be here. Pleased to have everyone on the phone and be speaking to you today about client success. So a little bit about me. I live in Utah, got an early start in technology companies working for Hewlett Packard, sold um, enterprise servers, storage networking, um, and then also supported resellers in the channel. So helping them be productive selling HP products. I was then introduced to a SaaS technology company, Pluralsight, and I stayed there for quite a while, over six and a half years. So I was there from their early stage all the way through IPO, um, and then eventually left when I was the director of client success there for commercial teams. Um, today I'm at Everyone Social, and we are in a really fun stage where we're experiencing really accelerated growth, and we're having to scale the team and grow the team. So I'm just really deeply involved in designing and building that out right now. Awesome. Really nice to have you here, and I'm sure some of your experiences from being in small companies and companies that went public will be great for people to hear about, so happy to have you. Next up, we've got Clark Dixon. Um, Clark is from Experity Health. He's Director of Client Success Operations. Clark, if you don't mind sharing a little bit about yourself and what you do yeah. over there. Um, so like Dan said, I'm the Director of CS Ops at Experity. We're an urgent care electronic health record organization. Uh, I just joined that team uh, about four months ago, came from a much smaller healthcare SaaS company called ER Express based in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, there I was the director of customer experience, so oversaw support, implementation, and customer success functions. Um, prior to that, went to school at Furman University in Greenville, South Carolina. So I've been in the healthcare software space for about six years now, um, primarily on the CX side of things. Um, so right now in my, my ops focus role, I technically sit on the revenue operations team, uh, basically partner with the CS implementation and support leadership to kind of help operationalize and execute uh, on their vision. Awesome. Really nice to have you here with us, Clark, and look forward to the discussion. All right. Lastly, we have Luis Carranza, VP of Client Success and Sales, um, a special combination there, Luis, at Meltwater. Um, Luis, if you can tell us a little bit about your experience and what you're currently doing at Meltwater, that would be great. Sure thing, Dan. Uh, first of all, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, such a cool panel to discuss something I'm I'm quite passionate about. Uh, as mentioned, I am part of the senior leadership here at Meltwater. I lead both our new logo acquisition team as well as our client success team here at Meltwater in the Americas. Uh, and Meltwater, just to give you a little background, is a media intelligence company. We work over 30,000 customers uh, across the globe. 
so I've been with Meltwater now. I, I'm one of those anomalies. I've been with the company for close to 15 years. And since startup to high growth uh, to now just recently a listed company uh, in Europe. So I've been part of the whole evolution of our client success organization, which is a, a fun thing to be a part of. Uh, and then on a personal note, I, I currently live in Miami, Florida. I um, I like to go on uh, Olympic triathlons. I'm about to do one on May 16th. And, and then uh, happily married, I got uh, for over 13 years, I got two kids. And uh, as I'm thinking about this webinar, I'm also thinking about what am I planning to do with them during their spring break next week? Because it's just them and me. Uh, and I need to get that together and get that going. Anyways, excited to be here. Hey. We might have some ideas for you as we go through this and you're sharing your ideas for everybody else. We'll try to, we'll try to keep that in mind. <clears throat> really nice to have you here, Luis. Thanks for, thanks for participating. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. Our first thing we're gonna do is do an audience poll. And so we wanna hear how, how people's companies are with this situation, right? So um, the question is, or the topic is, we know what matters most to our customers and we're closely aligned on what we've got to do for them and their goals in 2021. What we're gonna do is put the poll up now, appreciate, we're gonna give everybody 45 seconds or so to respond to it, then we're gonna review the results with the panelists. You know, and interestingly, while, we, uh, while we're talking about this, like this question seems, it's actually harder than it seems, right? Because it's, it, as I've been thinking about it, like in those situations where, look, if you're not speaking with your customers regularly, if you're not asking the right questions, if you're a product focused company and a lot of customers are self-service um, and how they engage with your, your solution, you might actually be very challenged to answer this question um, with certainty here. So I'm curious to see what the audience has to say. All right, so the results are in. It looks like about 50% feel like they are closely aligned with their customers and know what their goals are um, working towards for this year. And about 50% either don't know um, or believe they are not aligned with their customers. So let's talk about those for a second because that's, that's interesting. Luis, you know, let's start with you. Like, do those results surprise you? What do you, what do you think about that? Yeah, I, I think what surprised me was um, how honest uh, the the panel or the the answers were right. I think um, I think it's very easy and myself included to know, for example, what the value propositions of our product is to our customers, what the business reasons are in general for our products for our customers. But that's not necessarily like you were saying. It's more complex. That's not necessarily answering what matters to your customer at that moment. And I think when you really think about it, it is a tough question and it's a fluid question with fluid answers depending on. On where we are and uh, this year being one of them right yeah i was actually expecting as i was reading the wording of the question i was like uh oh like everybody might say it's true on this one um but to your point you know i'm glad that we got a, a good mix of answers because i think that's really the reality brooklyn what do you think yeah i would say well we're here in march so maybe we got more true answers now versus if we had asked the same question in january when a lot of us are trying to out what our customers are doing and what the strategy is. The ones that said don't know, if I had to take a guess, I would say that's a lot of unresponsive customers, right? Like it's not because you didn't try and figure out what they, um, what their goals are, it's that they probably haven't told you um, despite your best mm. effort. So not surprising, but very um, insightful. Very telling for sure. Clark, what about you? How do you, how do you interpret those results? Yeah, so I, I agree with you know Luis and that I, I was a bit surprised that there were so many false and I don't know, you know, roughly or exactly 50%. Um and I, I think like Luis said, it's it's easy to just think that, you know, we as a company we're so used to reading and, and rehearsing our value proposition. It's easy to just fall into the trap of thinking, well, that they signed up with our product, that must be what matters to them is like our value prop. Um so I think it's important to to remember that that might not actually be what's most important right now and maybe it was a year ago when they signed on but it might not be anymore so constantly reevaluating is is important so i'm happy to see that there are um so many people who are honest with that and understand that you know it might take some more digging 
Yeah, and the reason that, you know, I'm going to go to the, the next slide here because it's right on this topic, right? The reason that I wanted to start with this question is, you know, the most effective way to be successful in 2021, even at the very basic level, is to know what your customers want to do and how they want to get out of it, right? And, you know, I keep hearing over and over again that a lot of people are not, don't feel like they're that well aligned with their customers. So let's talk now about you guys. Let's hear from the panelists in your companies. Like, how do you understand what matters to your customers now and what's going to matter this year? And, and how do you collect that insight and, and act on it? Um, Clark, why don't, why don't you kick us off here? Yeah, so for us, we, you know, we're, we're fortunate in that there were some regulatory changes that heavily impacted almost our entire customer base this year. Um, so that's some low hanging fruit for us and that we know that we can help our customers achieve, you know, very specific outcomes specific to our industry. Um, you know, more broadly and perhaps more relatable to other audiences. Uh, I think the big one for us is, is always going to be ROI. I mean, I think um, in, in any space, we're seeing a huge boom in, in number of products that we're using. Our tech stacks are growing, even as a consumer in the B2C space, the number of tools that I'm using is growing. Um, and I think the more that we um, utilize software around us, it's going to be more important to kind of reevaluate what's actually providing us value. Um, and, you know, I think we'll also see some lingering impacts, financial and economic from COVID that will probably yeah. uh, impact where, you know, we're spending our money and probably tighten wallets a little bit. Um, so I think being able to prove and communicate ROI is going to be of uh, most importance to our customers and to us. Yeah, it's interesting that you bring up ROI because even the, the what do people consider ROI can change over time, especially if your solution has multiple use cases. User IQ is one of those situations, right? We've got five or six different primary use cases, each one with a different ROI. And sometimes people want to accomplish this one. And the following year, they might want to accomplish something different based on how their business has changed. So you got to keep up with, um, you know, what ROI is your customer tracking to, to make sure that you're hitting their goals. Um, Luis, what are your thoughts on this? How do you guys think about it at Meltwater? Yeah, I mean, for sure, ROI will, will definitely be something present. But I think for us, um, it's kind of exciting, kind of scary how fluid uh, what our customers have cared about in the last six, nine months has been. Uh, I would say if, if I go back to mid 2020, you know, entering Q3, uh, majority of our buying persona, which is marketing, comms, PR, uh, they were they were facing a tightening of budgets, cutting of staff, cutting of budgets than departments, right? So our tool not only was valuable in the sense of the tool itself, but our buyers, our decision makers, were using our tool to justify their positions themselves, right? Is what mm -hmm. I'm doing, is my department producing and creating justifiable to keep existing? So we had a lot of customers caring for that specific thing, sort of survival, right? Let's keep doing what we're doing, and this tool will allow me to justify what I'm doing. Um, but now as with the economy ramping up again, as we see departments growing again, budgets growing, uh, I think we still see some changes or scars, uh, depending on how you want to see it from, from 2020. And now what we're noticing is, yes, a lot of value props still exist, but our, our clients want to create a consolidation of vendors. So one provider, as opposed to multiple providers in, in, within our industry, I think that's something that they've realized uh, from last year, not that many relationships should be managed but also the relationship with a good consultant, a good customer uh, success rep. And we've noticed that the clients that are very happy with us are the ones that have multiple services and have that relationship with our consultants. So those, those two things are things that we are, are really honing into this year to offer to our customer base. Awesome. And Brooklyn, I don't want to leave you out of this one because I'm sure you got some great insights from everyone social. How are you guys thinking about it there? Yeah, I have to echo Clark and Luis's um, comments just around um, budgets changing. Um, we mo mostly work with marketing teams and with COVID when that happened, you know, there was a strong theme across all of our clients that they were not prepared for what COVID would do to their communication strategies internally. So we are focused on employee advocacy. Um, so moving into this year, a lot of them have been doubling down on their programs. So we are at a place where we're trying to help them scale and bring on more people so they can 
um, communicate internally about what's happening in the business, but also externally to amplify their brand. So how are, you know, we helping socially sell? How are we getting webinars, events out into the world and messaging? Mm -hmm. um, but it does come back to an ROI, right? So they have to justify the dollars spent there. So we need to be able to quantify that for them. So I'd say that's the majority of the focus is scaling and then also proving value. Awesome. Got it. Thank you. So, you know, obviously this begs the question, right? And your all of your businesses might be to some degree different. And I'm sure there's a variety in the audience, but like understanding what is going to be that important thing for your customers is hugely important, right? So how did you guys gather that information? What techniques or tricks do you use to find the patterns and themes? Because I think it's easy for a leadership team to just say, hey, listen, like this is what our service does. So clearly that's important to all of our customers that are still with us, which is not always the most important thing that will make them renew 12 months from now. So I'm curious how you guys figured that out and, and some uh, suggestions you can make for the people listening. Uh, I got to pick somebody to start first, don't I? Luis, how about you? Yeah, I, to be honest, and I mean, in, in it depends on where you are on, on your stage in the company. But when we started doing this, uh, I'll, I'll go a little bit a couple of years back, we learned by making a ton of mistakes and, and seeing a lot of our clients actually leaving. And, uh, and once, uh, once we started ramping up our, our CS team, which started with me, me. Uh, can you guys hear me? I feel like there's like an echo there. Anyway. Yeah, that was, I was switching out. I told you my AirPods were going to die. They died. <laughs> I had to switch them out. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> All right, no worries, no worries. Okay, let's uh, let's let's redo that one. <laughs> but but um no, I, I think eventually what we started seeing is is we started ask. I mean, as simple as this sounds, we started asking why. Uh, we started uh, first without before we had any processes. Um, and I was the first CS rep for for the Americas here at Meltwater. We just went on a mission, calling all our clients that left us and f understood why. And then all the clients that stayed, why? Like, why are you with us? Why do you keep being with us? And so on and so forth. And I think uh, that ultimately is the thing that you have to do, right? Really be asking and have a finger on the pulse as to why is that client with or not with you anymore uh, or going forward. Mm -hmm. And I think from there, once we started understand, understanding that, then it's a lot easier to really build personas and, and playbooks and really create processes uh, and internal tools that could help you like flag and identify, you know, change of needs or change of, of processes. But I think uh, sort of what Clark was saying before, like if it, um, like uh, in, in a different way, like we, you can't just start with what you feel they want or what you feel they should have had. You've got to ask them why and, and having those com tough conversations. So I think that's where we started. And then the rest, uh, we started building the rest afterwards rather than building everything and then asking why. Real quick follow up on that is, do you think the necessary way to do that and really glean an insight from that is a phone call conversation, not a, can it be done over a survey or are you just missing too much context if you're doing a survey? I think, I think a combination. I think surveys will, my opinion would be is surveys give you some good understanding, but it's, it's hard to you still have to interpret it in one way or another, right? And, and and finding that right balance of how many questions, is the question a leading question? Is it is it set up in a way to give you the data that you want to hear? At least we've always struggled. We've changed our survey multiple times, our, 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 our surveys, mm -hmm. uh, internal surveys. Um, so I would argue that a phone call, nothing nothing beats an actual conversation with, with a person and, and going through uh, the questions and, and having a tough conversation, just like in any relationship. Yeah. If nothing else, just so you can't do that with everybody. If, if if you can't do that with everybody, you at least try to do it enough times to validate the responses in the survey and see if your questions are producing accurate answers. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Brooklyn, um, how do you think about this? What techniques do you guys do to figure out what matters most? Yeah, definitely. Um, just so Luis doesn't feel left out, we've made, I've made the failure in the past of assuming what we, we think we know what customers want, right? And so you get to that place in time where you're delivering value and you put all these things in front of them and they don't care about any of them, right? You like totally <laughs> mark. Yeah. 
I think all of us in CS, having been around in this industry for a little while now, you want to avoid those painful experiences at every cost. <laughs> so um, what our team has been focused on this year, early in the year, we, we have the privilege and the benefit of meeting with our customers frequently, frequently as, um, as frequent as weekly. So, you know, we started the year with understanding what their goals and objectives were. And that's truly how you find out you need to ask them. And of course, we'd love to do that in person. We can't this year, uh, but we go through some discovery. Every customer is at a different maturity. You have to think about your product and where it fits in the industry right now, right? Are you with early adopters, late adopters? Sometimes you really truly have to paint the picture of what could be. So sometimes they have to see, okay, here are like the common use cases of how customers use us and this is the value they extract. And sometimes you have to take them on a journey. So once we identify those things, you want to make them quantifiable, right? So you want to kind of bucket them into different categories of, you know, are we going to get people, especially if it's SaaS and technology, are we going to get people engaged in the platform? We're going to get them using it. We're going to get them enabled and then have a positive experience in the tool. So my team then documents it in an account plan. And then we have a sheet that every time we meet with our customers, we're looking at those KPIs, right? You're not going to just set them once and never look at them again, because you want to continuously deliver deliver value over time um, and get those wins with the customer throughout the cycle of the year, not just, you know, month nine before renewal, and then you're hoping to secure that renewal. So that's kind of how we're focused on you, gathering that. It would be interesting, and you, you know, if anything of this is confidential, please feel free to ignore my question. But like, when you think about KPI that you're reviewing with your customers, what are some of the things that Matt, that is really helpful for them? And, and also in the, in the spirit of we're helping you achieve your goals, is it Here's how money, how much you're using our product. Here's how many campaigns you released in, in your situation. Is it, here's how much we can attribute what we've done to revenue that you guys have produced. How do you, some specific KPI examples I think might help the audience put this in context. Yeah, so this, um, the first met metric is usually getting people into the system, right? Like how many redeemed licenses do you have? How many outstanding you don't wanna have any sit empty? The second one would be active user rate, right? Like how many people are engaged in the tool on a regular basis and that's a large indicator of value if they're in the tool frequently. The okay. second and or the third and fourth are a bit more specific to our product, right? So um, content that is being shared out into the world. How many engagements and clicks are we getting in that content? And then our customers, usually their web teams take that and they can see top of funnel lead generation as it goes down to marketing qualified leads, um, sales qualified leads, all of those. And then um, the last one is more of a quantifiable metric, right? What would you pay if you had done paid media versus earned media? And then we do a comparison on dollars saved. So it's a bit of a combination of something specific to us, but some that are specific, I think, just to SaaS in general. Yeah, no, that's, that's really helpful, especially where you get into like the what would you have spent elsewhere versus doing it with us, because that can help them. If they're getting results from you, you're kind of reinforcing the fact that we're doing a better, more cost effective job for getting you the same results as somebody else. That's a really good KPI to, to validate that they should keep using you and keep investing in your technology. That's really helpful. Thanks for sharing. Yeah. Um, Clark, on to you. Yeah, I, I think the answer to this really depends on your customer segment, your management strategy, hand, you know, company life cycle. I think a uh, you know, high touch or white glove approach for like an enterprise CSM would look very different than a tech touch or, you know, mid-market organization where maybe you are a CSM managing 200 accounts or something and you can't necessarily have a call with every single customer to figure out what matters most. Um, so this is something that I'm actually dealing with right now. I'm trying to put together a strategy on a, a tech touch segment that's new for us. Um, and so this could be completely wrong, but it's the way I'm, I'm kind of tactically looking at it right now is that you know, we'll take the, the enterprise accounts, those accounts where CSMs can, can chat with them on a weekly or a monthly or quarterly basis, where we can just ask them, you know, what, what actually matters. We'll, we'll document that and we'll track that through the rest of the, um, you know, customer life cycle. Um, and then maybe from there kind of distill down, like what are the big buckets of things that that segment found to be most important to them this year? Um, and then stick that into a survey and send that out to the these you know smaller accounts that don't have you know quite the same um, level of care from a CSM or not care it's a poor choice of words but 
level of management from a, a CSM uh, where they can't be on the phone with them. So that's kind of the strategy I'm taking. Maybe those that um, don't fall into like an even bucket then could be reached out to, you know, have a conversation with them, learn more about what they're doing and then kind of, um, extrapolate from there what might work best for the rest of that segment. So I think it, it varies, um, but that's mm -hmm. kind of the, the approach that I'm looking at it uh, from right now. Awesome. Thanks, Clark, for sharing. I'm curious, like, as you guys have figured out, hey, this is what we're going to focus on with our customers for this year. This is what we think matters. Did you feel like you and the rest of the leadership team were aligned in that idea, or did you have to change some people's minds to, con to do some convincing, or was there a perception that you had to change? Um, Brooklyn, why don't you kick this one off? Yeah, so I'm actually going to draw on some previous experience for this question. Um, as you think about client success in larger organizations, you interface with a lot more groups that you really have to story tell why client success exists and why it's important and how we can help one another. Um, so for example, client success in sales at a previous company, CS didn't own the renewal, sales did. So we had to be continuously working together and they had to understand what was our role in making sure that renewal came in, who does what in the life cycle. Um, I found that some of the best ways to foster that relationship is to set up meetings, to talk about, here's my team, like where the director would attend maybe one of their team meetings. Here's what we're focused on this year. Even if you have conversation around compensation, right? Like here's how CS succeeds. And that way they get an idea of like, how do I help you succeed? And then I can help, you know, sales succeed as well. So I think just trying to create bridges wherever possible with possible with other groups so they understand where you're focused um, and that you can help one another, you know, achieve those expansion goals, quota goals, whatever they may be. Yeah, that's super, super helpful. Um, thanks for sharing. <clears throat> Clark, how about you? Have you ever had any contentious situations, some misalignment like we like to call it sometimes between yourself and other leaders? Yeah, so, you know, I, having just come from a, a small company of about 20 people, um, you know, just three, four months ago, things looked very different. Uh, it was easy to, you know, hear what the customer was saying, tell it directly to CEO, to our head of product, head of sales. We could all sit, you know, across the same table from each other. And it's a totally different experience than being part of a 700,000, 10,000 person company. Um, where, like Brooklyn said, you really have to spend a lot of time building those bridges. Um, I think yeah. everyone wants to be aligned on this, but actually executing on it uh, can be pretty challenging. I think that it's important to kind of set that alignment at the very beginning of, you know, the at the top of the funnel. It should be something that sales is going through at the very beginning and establishing like this is the value they, you know, we're, we're selling them. This is the goal they want to achieve. That should be carried through to implementation, through to training, through however you know many orgs you have between um, that initial sale and renewals, whether that's staying with CS or going back to sales like that, that um, needs to be documented somewhere. It needs to be tracked and something that you can actually quantify an outcome and it needs to be um, you know, transmitted between all these different teams. And I think tactically that is much more challenging as you get larger. So. Yeah. I don't have an answer as to how to do that. I'm still learning myself. That's a big part of why I went from a, a startup to a large organization is I, you know, just personally, I wanted to learn what that actually looks like. So ask me again. So you're, not kick, you, <laughs> you're not ready to kick that and go back to a, back to a small <laughs> company where that's easy, right? Yeah, that would be too much fun. <laughs> not yet. Uh, Luis, uh, let's, wrap, let's wrap it up with your comments and we'll move on to the next topic. Yeah, of course. I, I think I definitely echo what Brooklyn was saying on 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 how to work with everybody and asking people and, and aligning on those. I think at the beginning for us, when we were on a startup mode, it was it was actually not that hard because it was the same people wearing different hats representing different departments. So I was legal, marketing, sales, and customer success at the same time. So aligning with myself isn't that hard. Um, but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, as we grew, it did become a challenge for us. Uh, I was actually tasked to lead our, our client experience uh, team uh, and methodology across the company. And, and what, we, what we were seeing through each department is that ultimately everyone said they wanted to be customer centric, but, but everybody was doing it in their own way with their own data to hit their own goals. So the yeah. difficult part 
not so much that people didn't agree, yes, let's think about the customer, customer success matters, is that they cared about specific data for different goals. And I think what, what helped us out was sort of to, to what Brooklyn was saying in those conversations is, was an alignment also from the top saying, we want to be customer centric in this way. And then having these conversations with each one of the departments, like what they, almost like talking to a customer, what data matters to you? What is your end goal? How does that fit into the bigger picture? And then, and then we were able to sort of start using one source of truth, uh, one set of data points, and, and, and creating a sense of buying, but also skin in the game for each department. So unified goals, as well as a unified, uh, I would even comp structure on, on certain things that matter for everybody, including, for example, uh, NPS score. Uh, every department then had skin in the game with that. So that also helped out in a Absolutely. tactical way, but a strategic way as well. Awesome. Yeah, that's really helpful. Thank you, Luis. I appreciate everybody's comments on this topic. Let's go ahead and go to um, the next discussion point. So, all right, obviously, step one, figure out what your customers want, right? Um, if you're growing or even if you're not growing and you're, you're maintaining the same team uh, size that you have in place, right, getting the right people on the team um, hiring, training, making sure they know what to do and they're productive is very, very important. So let's talk for a minute about planning to win with the right team and the right technology so you can, so you can grow your business and effectively serve your customers. Um, so to that point, right, having, having the right team in place is key to scaling your company. Um, let's start with the people aspect of it. What does the job market look like for CS professionals? Because I know it's a really fast growing space. Um, that means there's a lot of new people entering that may not have experience. A lot of people shifting from one company to another. Do they have the right experience? Um, how do you guys look at um, effective recruiting, um, onboarding and training to build a great team? Clark, why don't you kick us off here? Yeah, I, so the CS space is absolutely booming right now, which is really exciting for CS practitioners, whether you're a leadership, individual contributor, trying to get into the space, wherever you are, I think there's there's a ton of opportunity out there. Um, again, just as SaaS as a, a um, you know, market is growing rapidly, you also have all these legacy companies and software orgs that are building CS teams for the first time. Um, so there's tons of opportunity for whatever stage you're looking to enter. Uh, I think the, and this has come up in other conversations I've had over the past couple of years, really is that there are so many flavors of CS out there. Um, you have some orgs that are highly support focused, some that are doing renewals and upsells and cross sells, and some that aren't. You have, you know, B2C, B2B, completely different enterprise versus SMB. Like there, there are just so many differences in, in what's available. Um, so I think for, you know, people out there, like there's, there's a ton of opportunity, but it's important to understand what it is you're actually signing yourself up, signing yourself up to do. Um, because again, those roles could look completely different just depending on the space, the org, the market, whatever. So um, that's a, a very interesting problem to navigate right now. Um, it just takes mm -hmm. a lot of digging. But I, other than that, I yeah. think there's there's tons to get into. Cool. So all right, cool. Thanks, thanks, Clark. Um, Brooklyn, when you when you're looking out at the market trying to trying to build out your team, um, you know, how do you go out and recruit good talent? What what do you look for? You know, what's your hiring process like if you don't if you don't mind sharing and uh, if you got a training program in place that you think is particularly effective you know how do you make that work yeah so i um have been lucky enough i guess if you think about it that way to hire two teams in the last couple of years so i've gone through this process twice um the market is booming is really great i had three positions open at my previous company i think we got 200 applications so people want to get wow. into cs and i think you also should really broaden like the scope of background you're looking for, right? Account management, people that are in sales roles could be really great in CS. Um, I think I'm in a place now where I want people that have experience in CS. I don't have to take more junior people. So when I went to recruit, you know, I, I was a CSM at one point in time. And so that gave me an additional benefit when I was looking for candidates because I could ask them questions about their processes, how they do things. Um, also knowing the type of business they're going into, um, ask about potentially those friction points that may exist, right? Like how do they handle conflict if they're working with sales a lot, if that exists at your company? Um, so I really Ooh, tried to- CS don't have conflict? <laughs> Never. Come on. Ever. 
Um, We're going to get to Luis in a second, who runs both of those teams. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we'll talk about no that. No conflict at all. <clears throat> um, so really trying to think through, like, what is it a day in the life truly? And I think you'll get better candidates when you're really transparent about what the role is, especially if it's a startup and it's going to take a lot of grit and maybe long days. Some people are more suited for that than others, right? Can you operate in gray areas where there's not a lot of defined processes or are you someone that likes more defined processes? So just really be broad with your questions around who would succeed in the role that you have today. Um, as far as training, you know, I if you're lucky enough, sometimes you have a whole sales enablement team, onboarding team that can truly bring people on and they go through a whole program. Right now, we're just doing it ourselves. I think pairing people up with um, current CSMs, getting them on as many calls as possible, have a little bit of a format for materials for them to go through. Um, I, at one point, like to really shadow. So like, hey, let's do a dry run of an EBR before you deliver it to the customer. Like you build it, let's dry run it, let's go through it, and then you deliver it, and I can give you feedback. So it just depends on the type of talent you have, where they're at, and how much extra help and, you know, mentorship they may need. Got it. Thank you, Brooklyn. Um, Luis, how do you guys how do you guys think about recruiting and hiring over at Meltwater? Yeah, and of course, no, avoiding the uh, conflict between that apparently exists between sales and CS. I've never experienced it, but I understand. I've never heard of said <laughs> conflict. Everything, everything is perfect. <laughs> CS loves everything. Handover, the handover is always brilliant. Yeah, expectation management is great. What they promised is exactly what we could deliver every single time. Hundred percent. <laughs> no, I, I think, I, I mean, it's uh, what both Clark and Brooklyn said is, is very thorough um, and, and very nuanced in terms of where your business is, who do you sell to, what you're trying to do, what, what, what market and everything. So uh, what I can add to it is a little bit more as to what our processes are and, and what we care about both in terms of recruitment and training. But then what is the key characteristics? I still do a lot of the hiring for our organization. I've done, I've hired hundreds of people for the company. And there's very specific things that we always look for. But in terms of the recruitment process, I mean, it, it goes without saying for all of us, uh, this is one of the most crucial hires, right? We're about to give, a, give them our most key possession of, of our company, which is our customers. So to ramp them up and for it not to be a fit and that person to leave within three months or decide to uh, fire them in six months is a very costly experiment. So I think you, you really need to have a very thor thorough vetoing, uh, veto, uh, yeah, vetting, and an in interview process. I, 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 don't, I wouldn't necessarily say replicate what we do at Meltwater, but uh, at Meltwater, we have group interviews for every single individual. And then they qualify to individual interviews and then another interview. And in that panel, we have the, the vice president, in this case, myself, the, the area director, the office director, the managers that might manage that person, and then a peer that would sit to, with that person to their left or to their right. And every single person that's hiring has been a rep once. So, so we try to make sure we have a thorough discussion into the skill sets, experience, quality. Now, we've hired 22 year olds to camp positions. We've hired people with 10 years of experience to camp positions. Um, we really, really depend a lot on our training methodology. So we do a, a very in-depth 12 month training program, but with a three month focus on onboarding to really get them going. And it's very hands-on. You're listening to calls, you're part of calls, you're going to demos from day one. Um, but if I touch on the skill set, just to finalize on that, I think ultimately what we look for is someone that can connect the dots, both in terms of what does a business do, like th that business acumen, do they understand what these companies do? Can you connect with what our product does? And can you read the data in between? If you're able to understand that, regardless of where you come from, then you can adjust to the rest. Uh, and it's that analytical and, 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 and business acumen that, that ultimately make, can make you very successful in CS, uh, even if the role is a little bit different in, in different organizations. Yeah, that's really super, super helpful. Um, all right, so on this topic, like if you, if there's CSMs out in our audience listening and you had to say, here's one thing that you should work on from a skill set perspective to stay in demand for hiring managers like yourself, what would that thing be? Clark, why don't you take this one first? Yeah, so again, kind of going off of that last question, because there is so much variability in the space, I don't think that there's necessarily like one specific skill that you need to hone in on. Um, rather, 
I would say a couple of things. First, get involved in the CS community, whether that's global or local or whatever. Um, there's tons of great organizations out there. There's meetups. There's great content creators. Just start getting involved and start understanding the literature and the knowledge and what other people are working on. Um, industries trends, you know, that's all extremely important. Um, you know, tactically, just something that I've done in the past that has has worked out well for me, and I've enjoyed it and gotten to to speak with some really really great people that I look up to a lot. It's just you know reaching out to people, finding people on LinkedIn. I um, you know, I, I actually have an Excel doc of names of people that I look up to and I follow on LinkedIn. I read their content and I get alerts when they publish stuff. Um, and I try to, you know, read what they're reading. I know like Dan is on that list. Um, I just reached out to Dan yesterday. Say, hey, what are some books you recommend? So I want to read what Dan's reading. You know, I want to read what Sweet. Um, Brian Chesky's reading, things like that. People that I'm looking up to that I want to start understanding what they're involved in and get involved in the same thing. So that's um, my biggest recommendation is just start getting involved. Um, outside of that, um, you know, there's there's certainly some, you know, certifications and things that are picking up more and more weight. I know, you know, Success Hacker, you're starting to see um, those certs on people's uh, resumes and LinkedIn's more, and I think that's great. Um, it's not something in the past that I would necessarily look for just because I, you know, I, I think it's it might be a useful um, certification for some orgs, but you know, my hiring experience was not um, looking for that type of uh, role. Rather, I was looking for people who could kind of like you know, Louis said, read between the lines and and think critically on those yeah. things. So that, that's really the okay. practice that. Thank you, Clark. Um, Brooklyn, how about you? What do you look for? What's one skill that you think people could be honing in on to stay in demand? Yeah, so I just was thinking about this quite a bit. And the one area that I would say everyone has an opportunity to improve on is um, negotiating access to stakeholders within the business. So oftentimes when things are churning and you're losing business, it's because you're single threaded and you're talking to the wrong person. So there's a number of ways that you can do that, but I think that that's a technique that everyone should practice and try and improve. Uh, first of all, understanding who your sphere of influence is today, who are you speaking with, and then how do you reach those other stakeholders in the business so that if things change, people leave companies all of the time. How many times have you lost your champion? And then you have to resell the whole program all over again. It's just nice to have other people in the business that understand why your tool or why your application is so critical to their business. So, um, you know, negotiation tactics. I mean, a lot of it comes intuitively. It's trust, right? Like if you deliver on what you say you're going to deliver on and then you ask for that access, usually you can get it. But there are other, um, you know, skills that you can hone in on when it comes to sequencing people, um, you know, just getting access to those other individuals in the business, I think, is probably the biggest area for improvement across CS. Yeah, building trust is like so, so important. And, and I mean, I saw Luis nodding also when you were talking about getting access to, to the stakeholders, and I totally agree. Even just getting comfortable asking for access. So many people are, are uncomfortable in that in sales and in CS. And just, you know, getting used to that, that that's part of your job and it's something you're going to have to get comfortable to. Um, and you're going to have to find techniques and ways to to ask for that access and not be afraid of it is a really hard skill to master. <clears throat> Luis, and and, and I would add to that. This? Yeah, yeah, I would add to that. I mean, not only uh, it's a difficult skill to master or a, or a crucial skill to master, but also understanding the difference of the conversation and what to talk about when you have a conversation yeah. with a stakeholder and someone that happens to be a user on the account or just another person within the subscription. I think that's a that's a key component there. So uh, I, I think what Brooklyn said is, is perfectly negotiation skills, sales skills. Ultimately, there is uh, that ability to be able to connect and with the decision makers and the stakeholders is important. That is comes down to sales and getting out of your comfort zone. Uh, so if I could add something is, is, is that uh, what I recommend is this is a role where you should be out of your comfort zone as well and genuinely curious and genuinely pursuing to understand a bit more and 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 ask these questions so 
if, if you're looking for a job or, or you're looking to get in, I think a key component is to be genuinely curious, to be interested in business, to be interested in what's going on, because that's going to make you successful as a CS rep. If you wait for uh, someone to come to you or for the red flag to show up or for the data to tell you what to do, a lot of the times it's too reactive. Uh, you have to be proactive with this with this relationship and proactive with the data as well. Um, so I would think yeah. you have to be out of your comfort zone. Great, awesome. Thank you, Luis, for and thanks everybody for your comments on that. I'm going to go ahead and go to the next topic for the sake of time. We've got about 15 minutes left, so we're going to do uh, we're going to do another poll here as a lead into our discussion. And so we've got we understand what customers want. We've got the team hired. We've got them trained. We feel good about ramping them up and engaging with them with their with our customers. And then there is data, right? Everybody wants data. So the question here, the topic here for this poll is, we've got the data, we've got reports and dashboards, but we're missing the clear, easy to access, actionable insights. Really curious as to how the companies that of our audience members, um, their experiences with that. So we're gonna put the poll up, 30 to 45 seconds, hope everybody can participate in that, and then we'll talk about the results. You know, while these are coming in, you know, this is one of the most common themes we hear in CS today, right? The industry is seeking, just like wanting that data. Um, a 360 degree view of customers is something I hear all the time. I think we're moving towards a place of having insights. I'm not sure that we've actually arrived there yet, but, but progress is being made. We're really curious to hear, you know, how the audience thinks about this. <clears throat> All right, so there are the results. 45% uh, of people feel that they do have the actionable insights that they need and about 55% either don't feel like they have it or don't know if they have it. So let's talk a little bit about that before we get into the next topic, Luis. Um, do these results surprise you at all? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's again, I, I, I'm very happy uh, with the honesty on it. Uh, I think having and wanting data uh, and having it available is good. How many people actually have actionable data uh, insights from them and can do something out of it? I, I think that's, that's the general problem right now with most organizations. Uh, and I would say probably, I would say, those percentages would be higher on the on the false uh, if if you were to pull me. Okay, awesome. Um, Clark, how do you think about this? I so I think I expected to see more responses from people who don't feel like they have actionable insights, just based on everyone I've spoken with in the past year who is constantly evaluating their health score and evaluating the metrics they're using to actually measure success. Um, and I think there's a, a huge trend to just collect all this data. You know, we're, we're in an exciting time where we can finally can you know, just start collecting and analyzing and storing just huge amounts of data on our customers, how they interact with us, how they interact with our products. Um, we can either even measure sentiment on phone calls to understand like what is their voice saying that their words aren't, you know, so there's there's all this stuff that we can collect relatively cheaply for the first time in you know, ever. So I think there is a huge temptation to to collect all of that. And I think we're still in a phase where we just don't know what to do with it yet. Um, so I, you know, I. I, I would have expected more people to say that they don't have those actionable insights just based on the sample size being the people that I've spoken with in the past year who are in the same boat, who don't know what to do with the data they have. Yeah, interesting. Brooklyn, how do you think about it? Yeah, I, <clears throat> knowing kind of the, my experience in CS, knowing the type of people that are attracted to CS roles, truly at their core, they want to please, right? Like we want people to have successful outcomes. We want them to have um, a delightful experience in the application. So, 
you know, I think a lot of my CSMs would say like, okay, tell me what the insight is and like, what's the play, right? Like I get this indicator, now tell me what to do. And I think what's difficult um, is that every customer's culture is so different. Like you could do one play on someone and it works 100% and then you can try the same thing on another customer and it totally flops. So I think that's also where some of the kind of hesitation is, is with the actionable insights. They don't always work like you, or you know, like the actions you take from them don't always deliver as, as expected every time. Got it, yeah, 100% agree. So, all right, well, cool. Let's, let's, let's dig a little bit deeper into this topic. Um, I'm gonna switch the slides here. Oops, went too far, here we go. Um, and this is a reminder to the audience, right? If anybody has questions for the panelists between now and the end of the discussion, feel free to, to post those in. We're happy to, to bring them into the conversation. But again, here, right, better data, right? A common theme that I hear, we want that 360 degree view of the customer. We want lots of insights. Well, let's talk about actually the foundation of that, getting started. And, and again, with the theme being back to the basics, let's start with the key pieces of intelligence that you're trying to arm your team with. Clark, we'll, we'll start with you. What are what are those key pieces of intel you you seek to provide to CS? Yeah. Uh, so again, you know, with there being so much data out there and what we can measure, um, you know, I think the common pieces that we see is you know feature adoption, daily active users, number of licenses. Those are all those are great, um, but I don't think that they truly measure customer success or or predict customer behavior. I think if you were to you know get rid of your 800 or you know 100 point CS health score and just go back to one thing. It's just, are we actually delivering the outcome that we agreed upon with the customer, whether that was at the beginning of the sales process or the last time we spoke on our QBR, are we actually measuring that outcome? Are we meeting the goal and are we setting new goals? I think that is a very easy thing to quantify. It's just a yes, no, if not, what do we have to do to get there? Um, and I think that's really the, you know, again, talking to CS leaders who are, everyone is always constantly reevaluating their health score because it doesn't work or the CSMs don't trust it, or it's, you know, it's incomplete. Um, I think we're working towards that, but I think in an effort to make it better, people are adding more to it and adding more complexity when we need to be stripping away from it and just going back to what is the most basic thing that we're here for. Our prime directive is to, make sure that we're helping our customers meet their goal and that's it. And can we measure that? Yes or no. And I think that's the, the, the core, you know, task that we need to go back to is, is CS practitioners. That's, that's really interesting. Thanks Clark. We're going to get to, we're going to dig a little bit deeper on some of your points there about health scoring here in a minute, but um, Brooklyn, uh, how do you, how do you think about those core pieces of Intel that you want to provide to your team? Yeah, this is um, an effort that we're embarking on at this moment where right now we don't have an automated health score. So we don't have a lot of automated data points that are flowing into the CSM. So they have to go and seek a lot of these data points. So to Clark's point, a lot of them are application related, right? So how engaged are they in the platform? What are the leading indicators, right? So are they engaged in the features? Um, my team does a health sentiment update each week, and the health sentiment is a composition of quantitative data points and qualitative data points, right? So we're trying to understand, you know, using the system, but what's the access we have? What are they saying about their experience in the platforms? They have a lot of bugs and issues. Like, it, you really need to think holistically about the data and what it's telling you. Um, yeah, I would say that's about that's really where we're at right now. We want it to be a bit more sophisticated in the future where we can have some alerts in place that might tell us things that should be concerning and or are positive. So we, I think sometimes we think about, okay, let's point out the negative things, but what are the indicators that are leading to expansion, right? Do you have a lot of people flowing in that are using the product on an individual basis? Do you have leads coming in? Um, we are always going to push our customers, right, to expansion, especially with SaaS business. There's always more TAM to capture. And that's truly where we succeed is if they're healthy and moving along the way, expansion will come. So we also want to see both sides of those. Perfect. Yeah, thank you, Brooklyn. Luis, how about you? Yeah, I, I think it goes very similar to the, one of the questions we had before. And I think to, to, to Clark's point, I think it's, it's, it's definitely, at the end of the day, the most basic thing is, is it getting, are they getting value 
for it or not. But however, to that same question before, right? If you have over 200 clients, if you're doing purely tech touch, if it's it's really hard to ask that question, or perhaps you're not getting a, a if you're sending a survey, it's pretty hard to get a, a whole uh, high percentage completion rate, right? So so it, yeah. it goes back and for me, it, like it goes back and forth. Yes, that's simple, but then we also need a little bit more of data, and I think that's the rabbit hole that that we that we consistently fall into. For us, what, what we've been doing on the key pieces of intel for us, it's we've, we're trying to divide it based on where the client is on their journey. And based on where they are in the client journey, maybe certain data points are a little bit more important than others. And you know, I think the simplest ones were mentioned, right, when it comes to uh, activity, engagement, adoption, right? And, and those metrics can differ depending on the products that they have. But what we're trying to do, uh, and is this ties into what Brooklyn was saying, is we're trying to get what those numbers are based on clients that have renewed, clients that have uh, bought more services, and clients that have uh, canceled. So that we're trying to get more validity through that some simple data by analyzing deeper data. So that's how we're trying to keep it simple on activity and adoption, okay. but we're being very thorough as to where that data comes from. Got it. So that's, that's really that's really helpful too. Thank you. Thank you all for your comments on that topic. With the with the interest of time, we've got one more uh, small topic to focus on. Which I know this isn't a small topic because we can go for hours on health scores, but health scores, right? Obviously, a lot of the data that people are collecting, you want to pull that into a an easy to understand one number, one color indicator on how how healthy is this customer, right? Um, what's been your experience in that? Where has it served you well? Where has it failed? Um, Luis, why don't you continue on and take us through this one? Yeah, I'll, I'll do a little plug on myself. I uh, I actually created a health score for Meltwater uh, in 2011. I don't know if there were, we called it Project Solomon. Nice. And uh, it, I thought it was great. So I believe in health scores. I love it. But uh, the difficulty was that uh, was adoption. We had a lot of people thinking that because it said green or red, that it would definitely churn or definitely renew. And I would get reps calling me to try to prove me wrong. It's like, see, you had it all wrong. This health score is horrible. Uh, but outside of that, we, we do use a health score. We always toy with and tweak it and, and try to simplify it, expand. Uh, our, our belief is there's, there's definitely a benefit and there should be something there. Um, and what I'm noticing is that it's an ever evolving proposition. I think, I think you should have one, but you should be constantly checking it to see if it should change or be adopted. And that's okay. Uh, it doesn't mean it's yeah. wrong. It means it's fluid, just like the relationships you're uh, in with your clients. Absolutely. Um, thanks for that. Clark, how do you think about health scores? I'm sure as a, yeah. on, on the CS operations side, you probably think about health scores quite a bit. Yeah. So I, you know, I think about it very tactically and just what are, the numbers we're pulling, how are we calculating them, and does it actually impact, you know, or predict the the outcome that we think it's going to predict? So um, I, I think there's a, you know, hundreds of data points you could use. I think the ones that are most interesting to me uh, that I've heard lately are whether or not an account is multi-threaded. So do you have contact with multiple stakeholders? Um, of course, NPS, CSAT, all the satisfaction surveys, super important. There needs to be some space for um, CSM sentiment. How the CS rep feels about the account is very important. They have a great pulse on, on the customer. Um, and then of course, product usage. So if I had to like bucket the, just very tactically, the things that I'm looking at, that's kind of the, the maybe the four main buckets. Um, and then from that, like Luis said, it's just, it's it, there's kind of two parts to this. There's going back to see if, you know, if you've been tracking this data over time, can you measure that against customers that have churned, customers that have, you know, renewed or upsold, whatever, to see if those metrics actually impacted past accounts and then look forward and measure through time to see if they impact future accounts. And that's the piece uh, that just takes a lot of time because you just need yeah. customers to churn and renew to actually measure or not what, you know, if it works. So that's, right. I think, why it, it takes, it takes months and years. Yeah, you're right. right. It takes, you can, you can set your health score based on a bunch of assumptions only to find out six months or 12 months later, your assumptions are wrong and go back to the drawing board and keep tweaking it. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, Brooklyn, last last up on this topic. Let's, uh, let's bring it home. From like their next meeting. I would just say, 
Um, don't over-engineer it. I've been in an organization where we had way too many data points flowing into it and the CSMs didn't believe it. At, at, at the end of the day, give more weight to the CSM sentiment and then also marry that with product engagement. Um, and I like the sphere of influence component too. Just, just make it simple um, and I think that you'll be in a better place and the CSMs will adopt that health score more if they believe it. Perfect. Thank you. I, I did have one question come in, so I do want to see if we can maybe get one of you to respond it before we wrap. Um, the question is, going back to the earlier topic of hiring, what industries and our types of background do you guys believe provide for the best CS experiences and the, and the candidates you might find? Um, I'll leave this one for Luis. Uh, I, uh, all right. Well, I, I think it, it, it always helps to somebody... It, some, to hire somebody within your own industry, right? Because they already come with the knowledge as to uh, the key players, the buying centers, the decision makers, or at least that have worked in a similar ecosystem. Uh, I think that's going to help you when it comes to uh, onboarding that person and getting them up to speed. Uh, you'll have less resistance on that. But I think, I think cap, don't be afraid to cast a wide net outside of your industry as well, uh, because you'll find a lot of gems and talents that it can replicate their knowledge from what they're doing to your business. At the end of the day, CS, as you notice, like we're talking different industries here, it's similar components. Uh, that's just the details, but knowing the framework, you can do a little bit of everything in, in any industry. Yeah, and you were saying earlier, one of you was saying earlier about, you know, listening skills, being able to ask good questions, get to, you know, get higher in the organization. You know, that translates across lots of industries. And you know, being empathetic to customers and the concerns that they have, and being fast to respond to them, it's just—it's—I mean—it's hard to train somebody to do that. But if you can make that part part of your personality, that's something that a great CS rep would do, regardless of industry or background, right? Um, okay. Well, anyway, we're like two minutes over. I apologize for that, but that takes us to the end of our time today. And I want to thank um, Brooklyn, Luis, and Clark for taking the time to prepare and be with us today. The discussion was really helpful. We're going to be sharing a bunch of stuff um, that we took out of, you know, insights that we gleaned from this conversation. We'll be sharing on social media. We'll send out the recordings to everybody as promised. And if anybody's interested in future webinars, we got another one coming up in May on customer journey mapping and all the things that go in and out of, of that process. So it should be a good event as well. Um, thanks, everybody, for tuning in, and I wish you all a good week. Thanks, guys. Bye. Thank you, All everybody. Right,